Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alshadar Santos, and during like the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'll be talking with you about this tricky thing, uh, that is how to build a production-ready front-end, even if your API does not exist. So, yeah, who am I? So, I'm Alshadar Santos, as I said, I'm 25 years old, and I'm a full-stack developer here at, at KI Labs. What do we do here at KI Labs? So, we are... Uh, a venture-focused uh, company, so we work with uh, lots of early-stage startups that want to discover their problems and uh, want help uh, finding the solutions, finding their product market fit. So, and that's why most of our team is a team with product background, because uh, yeah, we like to have people that can go to the client, ask the, uh, the right questions, and help them define what they need, and then help they they build a, a scalable project. Uh, I'm also very interested in software architecture, TDD, and product. So, front end. So, when you're hired to do front end, or when you're in a project doing front end development, you have one one goal in mind. And what goal is that? Your goal is to develop an amazing user experience. It doesn't matter if it's web, mobile. So, you always want to deliver an, an amazing user experience, and uh, to let your user do whatever he wants. And if you can add the light to it better. Uh, and for that, you're provided with some, some conditions. And that conditions are you're developing against a finished and documented API that's always stable. And your feature requirements are fully decided. Both yours and the backend are fully decided. But yeah, we know that's not how it always happens. So we have to you're, we're agile, we're like in fast-moving companies, we like to iterate, to use a test, to change things fast. And uh, yeah, so let's remember the goal. The goal is still the same. So even though the, the conditions uh, changed, our goal is still the same. So we're still uh, thriving and trying to develop an amazing user experience. Even though it gets a little bit harder with all this changing things. So yeah. The conditions, like the more real conditions, are pretty much like this. So you might or might not have a finished API, so you can be developing your front end ahead of the back end. And even if you have an API, it might not be documented. And if you're developing against a, remotely, uh, a remote environment, it can be unstable. So how many times were we, in, uh, were we in those situations where we're connecting with an API, but then it's unstable, and uh, we can't finish our features because of that? And yeah, so as I said, we're pretty much uh, all in like fast changing environments with agile companies and we like to test and change things fast. So fast changing feature requirements also uh, can be considered as a, a setback here. So yeah, as you might see, uh, some wild problems appear. Uh, so yeah, what if... Uh, okay, just to... Okay. So, recap, our main problems are developing against a not finished API with a probably unstable remote environment and with fast changing requirements. And yeah, so as the ecosystem developed, we're, we've been finding solutions for this. And they pretty much are, so we develop our front end ahead of the back end. So back end is not done, but you develop your front end. Uh, against the unstable remote environment, we pretty much always end up with a remote, uh, local environment that you can spin up, so, uh, spin up some Docker containers or some virtual machines. And to cope with the fast changing requirements, uh, we pretty much, like in some times, uh, we're needed to emulate backend changes locally. Either that uh, means that you go into your backend code and you change it, or you have any other way of uh, emulating it. Uh, and I'd like to, to ask in the audience, so if you've been faced with these problems, so how many of you have been faced with these problems? And now I'm, I'm curious on how you, you solved it in the past. So. Right, so we had a similar problem in one of the projects, and the solution was we created mods for the API data. Okay. Okay, we developed the front end, and then based on the mods, we Java API. Okay, okay, so but... If you have the basic structure, then it was refined by the... Okay, but were, were those mocks like living in the front end at the, at the beginning? Uh, they were living on our machines, yeah. Okay, okay. 
OK, OK. Uh, nice, because that's pretty much what I was going to say, because like the most plausible solution, at least the go-to solution nowadays, is to have local mocks. Like it doesn't matter how you sync it later, but you end up having local mocks. And lo local mocks are, are really great, because uh, they enable you to quickly develop and, sh and ship the working front end to a testing environment, so you can have your POs your, and your, your QAs testing the front end itself. Uh, with, with dummy data, with, with what we call dummy data, you can develop the happy path, so you can navigate between screens because you have all your data there. Uh, and one good thing is that uh, you can have the front end uh, leading the process to set your, your data, so you know what payload are you going to need. And this is why uh, I'm sure most of you have also used lo local mocks, uh, because like, they're actually a great solution. But let me show you an app that I have with, with local mocks, if I can. Let me mirror, because it makes it easier. OK, so let me show you the app I have with local mocks. Uh, OK. So. Let me zoom in a little bit. So this is my app with, with local mocks. So it's a to-do list, of course, like the to-do MVC typical list, uh, which it's currently running with local mocks. And I can do pretty much all the, all the features. I can test it. And it's actually deployed. So I can check to-dos. I can add new to-do require Alex, if I know how to type. Uh, we can check the completed ones. Yeah, so it's working. The only thing that's failing is, of course, as we're living with local mocks, uh, we're not saving it anywhere, and we didn't bother to, to write uh, logic to, to start in the front end, because like, it's temporary. But yeah, you develop with local mocks. The UI looks great. Uh, you're, you're fine. It's tested. But then somewhere in time, like a week after you started, your backend developers have the API finished. So what you can do, and let me zoom in. but. Uh, what you can do is, yeah, let me just show you the, the app uh, the first time you connect uh, with a backend. So I'm not here writing HTTP clients. So this is your app now. So you notice this? So when you reload, you got to your page, and then your to-dos appear. You can notice also that it says everything is done, and then the things appear, so no loading behavior. So you can also start adding new to-dos. So you had like require Alex, require Alex, and it seems to be working, so this one is fine. But then when you go and you come back to your app, you don't have a loading, and that to-do was not saved. So something failed, and the user has no feedback. And why? Like It's not uh, the developer's fault, because you were developing with local mocks. So Everything worked synchronously. It was instant. So you did everything you, you should. But yeah, so let me get back to my, to my presentation um, to remember you of the goal. So your goal was to develop an amazing user experience. And I could show you more, but I'm sure that none of you would consider that, that I just showed you, uh, amazing user experience. So you're lacking error scenarios, you're lacking loadings, uh, you're lacking user feedback. Uh, and even though it looked like one, and you, it was one when you were working with local mocks, now it's not one anymore. And yeah, we're still striving through this goal. And yeah, as I said, flicking, user, flicking UI, possible unknown crashes, and no feedback is given to the user. So this leads you leads us to some of the disadvantages of local mocks. And the biggest one is actually the first one, so it's ignoring network. Uh, we know that when we develop with local mocks and then later we have to just connect with the API, it's not just connect. So there are bugs on the network, there are bugs on the servers, we have bugs on our HTTP logic, and yeah, it, it makes it difficult because uh, we did everything we could in the past when we were developing with mocks. But then it doesn't work. So you end up only developing for the API path. And then your APIs can change, and API path 
can also change. And yeah, loading states, error scenarios, feedback to user, none of this uh, was there. So let me present you with Mirror.js. And just by a show of hands, I'm curious, uh, each one of you uh, have heard of, of Mirror.js? OK, interesting. Uh, so Mirror.js is an API mocking library that lets you build, test, and uh, share your application uh, without having to rely on backend services. So it basically enables you to write your app as if you're connecting with an API, but you're not. So you can develop everything. You, you do the exact same process, but you're not connected to an API. So yeah, a little bit of history. Mirror.js uh, started in 2015 uh, as an Ember add-on uh, called Ember CLI Mirage. And uh, it was pretty much the go-to solution in Ember projects. So whenever you start an Ember project, you add Mirage, and that enables, enables you to develop offline, to develop without spinning up a local environment. It enables a mentality that is getting bigger and bigger nowadays. That is the front-end first development. So it follows this good practice of letting the interface drive the implementation, not the other way around. And uh, it's widely used uh, for a standalone package that is like 30k weekly on NPM, and was recently extracted to vanilla.js package. And that's mainly what I'm doing this talk here today, because it's now usable everywhere. So let me go to the demo time. So I'll go back to my local Mox application. So and I'll try to add Mirage to it. So imagine that in instead of, instead of uh, having local Mox, we, we would let the front end drive the API itself. So if it's a to-do list, we know we're going to need uh, get slash to-dos. So what are we going to do? So let me open your, the file that is mirror's file that tells everything, but it shouldn't. Yeah. OK. So zooming in. Uh, so yeah. So the first thing we need is we need get API slash to do's uh, to do's to return all to do's. And for this, uh, let me present you, as I said, Mirage.js. So I'm importing server from Mirage. I don't expect you to remember all these commands, but hopefully the documentation can help you later. Uh, so yeah, let's create a Mirage server that intercepts the request. So you just create a new server. And let's define our route. So we currently know that a get to to-dos should return an array of to-dos. So, so is done should be false, text should be require Alex talk, and just for consistency, let's add an ID. Uh, and as your server is connecting locally, you can also say that the namespace is slash API. So with this, we can now go to my application that it's, it should be here. And at the moment, of course, it's the application with local mocks. So let's add the HTTP client uh, logic. So I'm going to my to-dos page, uh, to the logic. So you can ignore pretty much the, all the logic. Uh, where is it? Use the uh, OK, so it's there. So this is what I want you to focus on. So there's uh, an effect that uh, sets the to-do. So that's why it's instant. That's why it's a local mock. So let's then take the challenge of connect with our API. Uh, and then, of course, it's fetch. We have to do conversion to JSON. And then we, can, we have our to-dos, which we can use to set the to-dos. So, OK, which should work. OK, so let's see how our app behaves with this. So now you can already see the to-dos that are coming from, from Raj. But yeah, so 
we are not solving the problem yet. But as we're developing, we're able to notice it. So you're using hot reload, or every time you reload your page, you'll see that you don't have a, a loading behavior. And you probably actually coded that, but you just never implemented it because, yeah, you were developing with mocks. But Mirage lets you do this. And I actually recommend, and that's something I always do, is to provide with a bigger timing. So it's milliseconds, and then our app will be super slow. And if I refresh, OK, so now it's super clear that we're, we're lacking a loading behavior. And that improves the process, in my opinion, because it leads us to go here somewhere where it says everything is done and lets us do the is loading. Let's skip this. Uh, loading. Or oh, the other way around. OK, let me just be lazy. Uh, and let me check. OK, so I don't have the is loading here, but I'm adding it. Is state, it will be loading by default. And let me just find where is is loading. OK, so it now works. No, it doesn't. Uh, OK, set is loading. OK, nice. So now I'm doing it. This just for demo, but like set is loading true, even though this is not synchronous. But and then set is loading false. If you want to do this right, you can actually do this this way. Okay. Okay. So now we just added a tool that will make it uh, obvious what is missing on our application. And now you might be thinking, okay, but then. What happens to my add to do? So second to do. Yeah, it's added with local mocks. You go to another route, you come back, you have a loading, it's taking a lot, but then your to do is not there. So Mirage is a, uh, one of the biggest capabilities of Mirage is actually of the capability of providing an in memory database that you can use for these use cases. So here we just know our route, so instead of get is a post and should add a to do. Uh, and for this, let's do it the same way. So post slash to do's, a callback, and here we get the schema that is the object that has the database from Mirage, and we get the, the request. And here we can just say, okay, so my to do comes on the request body, so it's JSON parse the request, dot request body, bad naming, but that's life. Uh, and then you can just say, schema.db.todos.insert and insert the, the to-do. And I think this is it, but let's see how that happens. Uh, so I'm opening DevTools because Mirage, if I can zoom in, also logs you this. So let me try to have my, my to-do. Oh, it will not work. So let me just go to my save to-do function. That it's somewhere here, or create to-do. Yeah, so there is my function, and let me write my logic. So uh, API slash to do's method post and my body is my new to do that it's here. So but as it, as it's fetch and it's not the best API ever, we have to stringify it. Okay. So this of course uh, then we can add the get the to do that comes back from the server and persist it on the see it locally, but just for you to see the behavior. So, okay, so here I have our super lazy uh, application, then yeah, require LX2. So, and now my post is broken, of course, because that's life. Uh, and uh, let me just check. Oh, I'm shitting now, you know. Oh. But yeah, it's schema request. Oh, of course. So in order for Mirage to know uh, uh, what am I adding to the database, I have to define a thing in Mirage that are models. So I have to tell Mirage that there are a model called to do. So to do, it's a model, and it's 
auto importing from Mirage. So yeah, so now it should be working, but you know, live demo, so you never know. <laughs> uh, so to do number two, okay. Okay, so we got to 2001. So, and now, yeah, we go to the, the other route and come back. And yeah, so we still have our only require Alex talk. And that shows us the rest of Mirage capabilities. So if you go here to your server, you have an article uh, array that you can now do schema.db.todos. And if you do this, and let me see, okay, if I save, okay, now your DB is empty because you're not sending mock data. And that leads us to next step of this talk that is a seeding phase. So Mirage also allows you to create seeds. So you can say that when it's starting, yeah, it's a server injected here, you can say server.create to do and then just send it. So is done is false, false, and text is uh, hello, require Alex. Bad idea with escaping. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's see if this works, but, okay, loading, yeah. So I have the hello, require Alex. Uh, and actually, just to end, uh, like Mirage has a lot more features. It has integration with tests, with prototypes. So you can actually ship this application as it is to a staging environment or to a dev environment. And it will work because Mirage runs in browser. Uh, so you can have your QA team testing with real requests that only connect to an in-memory database. But now let me uh, show you a thing that we normally use to seed Mirage. So Mirage also lets you define factories and to do factory extend like this is the syntax so in here in your to do factory you can just say so it has one field it's called is done that it's normally false and then you can define functions in this case it's text these functions are they have a id as a parameter and then you you can just say okay so uh, to do number with id I. And now that you, you have defined your factory with all the fields you need, uh, you can just come here to the seeding phase and say server.create list of five, oh, it's a number, five, five, and it's to those. And let's hope it works. Because it's. Uh, Oh, it's, yeah, JavaScript, you know. It's not. Okay. Okay, so now you have our list of, of to-dos. And we, in these factories, they're normally used together with Faker. And I don't know if you heard of Faker.js. It's a library that's used to generate fake data. But together with Mirage, you can get pretty much, pretty much, uh, real test data which, where you can generate uh, text, emails, dates, images, URLs. So together with Faker, uh, it makes like a great use and you can develop your front end and you can see where the strings should overflow, where they should not, where are your loading states and so when all, all that, that stuff. So in the end, the experience we want would be something like, so everything working, let me just discard this. And yeah, so this is the experience you want. So when you load, you have a loading, and then when you're doing background stuff, first touch, uh, you have an icon in the top right that says that you have uh, stuff uh, working in the background. You can go to a different page and come back, and yeah, everything is working. And then remember, I talked with you about error states. So we developed for loadings, we developed for network, but we're still not doing logic to handle errors. And yeah, so Mirage enables you to do that. You can open your server and let's, for instance, this post route. I can just come here, use the 
Mirage response object and return the 500, but I have to instantiate it. Okay, so now whenever I'm trying to create a to-do, yeah, it doesn't work. And for this, uh, what have I done? Okay, so and for this, uh, even if you can do your logic uh, like with manual errors, so you can just go to any of your routes and add errors, um, yeah, that's still manual, and you can still forget about that. And that's why we've, we've developed a tool that is called uh, Mirage Chaos, where, let me see if I have a different branch. Uh, it's called Mirage Chaos, that uh, pretty much enables the chaos engineering practice that is widely used on infrastructure and on backend uh, together with Mirage. So it will get random routes to fail with the different errors. So you can have errors like uh, API that are normally fast are now taking lots of seconds. You can have random 500s, uh, gateway timeouts. You can have uh, 400s. So yeah, so for this, I'll add chaos. It's Package called Mirage.js, Mirage.js Chaos, and what this does it it basically wraps the server. So, so server with Chaos, there we go. And you add Chaos server, and then so you have a lot of options, uh, but uh, the option I want now is like Chaos level to be high. So this will increase the probability of your API failing. So and for this, get, let me just cheat because I want yeah I want this. So so I want all my errors to be 500. So here Mirage Chaos also provides you with an export called Chaos Cases. That's basically the case that it supports right now. And when I do this and I use this instead of Mirage Server as a a chaos uh, thing. Yeah, I'll have random routes failing now. So let me see if I can show you if it fails enough. Probabilities, you know. If it's working, because <laughs> we'll never know. Okay, so here you have one of the patches that tried to put walk the dog as true failing. And so that's what happens to your routes and that will lead you to, to develop these error scenarios because they're logged on the console and your app might break. And with this, we can now actually implement our error behavior. So I thought I had this error behavior implemented. Because yeah, okay, so okay, so with this we can just come here to the our our icon that seems to not be working. So we were patching stuff, right? So it should be on our save to do thing. Of course. It's in a wait. That's why it's not working. Okay, so let's now pray and do random requests. Okay, so now uh, you are warned that uh, an error is happening. So it's, it says chaos is happening. You can see the requests and you can actually code this thing. Uh, of course, you can also enable chaos in tests to always have an error. So you can test these cases and a lot more other things. So this is still a pretty much alpha package that adds this chaos layer to Mirage, but uh, I think it has potential. So yeah, getting back to my, to my presentation. So my problem solutions review. So not finished API, we're developing front end ahead of the back end. Uh, we can have an unstable remote environment that if we have the API contract, uh, we can do it with Mirage and write all the network logic. And we can cope with fast changing environments because now we don't need to talk with the guys, oh, I need this field or that field. Because uh, you can have that with Mirage, and in the end, you know exactly what you need, and you can sync with the backend guys. So, future ideas for the ones of you that 
get interested in this. So we're adding better TypeScript typings because TypeScript is getting heavily adopted and we need it. And it's also like long term, uh, we're thinking of uh, actually converting it to TypeScript, but it's like far along the way. So improving this chaos engineering to, to Mirage at the moment, it's only faking status codes, but we want to get access to your payloads and actually change them, actually add the, change the, their types and to see how your API reacts and how your code reacts to this. And uh, we're actually actually working also in the open API Mirage generator. So I haven't said this, but you don't need to go full on on Mirage. You can install Mirage in your project and you can just mock some routes and pass through all the others. So if you're developing a new feature, you can add this, uh, have your models, your factories, your logic for the new feature, but the rest continues to work and goes to your server. So it's not the same with TypeScript, so you can increment it. Uh, you can uh, do it in an incremental way, so you can adopt it incrementally. Uh, and our main focus with this is to try to decrease the cost of adding Mirage to a project. Because if in the end you end up doing some tweaks on the code, it already did like 70%. So yeah, and of course we'd love your help. So this is the core package, we have the website, we have Chaos and OpenAPI that are these packages I just presented, and any other package that you might find useful. You can also uh, join us on Discord, because uh, the community is quite cool. And thank you. So, questions? Uh, so, GraphQL, nice question. Uh, GraphQL is already supported, because as you, as you can, Look, let me show you. So here on the routes, uh, you can already do uh, this post GraphQL and implement your route. And then let me just show you an example. And I'm actually going to the, the community because I just had that question yesterday and I just forgot about this. Okay, so it's here. So, so imagine this was your, your route. So you can use the GraphQL official package and you have a, a route that is slash GraphQL. You can parse the request normally. You have your query and your variables on your GraphQL query. And you have your resolver. And then you can use the normal mirage in memory database. So you have your resolver and what you return is pretty much the, this is the uh, official GraphQL package. You just pass your resolver and your resolver instead of doing requests to other backends or other services will connect to the the Mirage API. I haven't showed you, but of course there's APIs in Mirage to update, to delete stuff. Uh, you can also like filter stuff, so you can get the GraphQL parameters and filter stuff in your in-memory local database, so for it to be bearable. Of course you don't want to write all your backend logic here because it, it loses the purpose. But yeah, it's possible, even though, and I, I've commented this with colleagues of, of ours here at K-Labs, that uh, we're planning to, to do this in a more seamless way. So you don't have to import uh, any other package, it's just Mirage GraphQL. You say this is a GraphQL route, this is your resolver and it should be done. But uh, yeah, at the moment it works, this is the way, it's on the website, but yeah. I expect to understand your uh, question. No more questions? You're in a scenario where you couldn't even use Mirage before. So you have the you have the backend ready already. Yeah. And you're the developer that joins the project. Yeah. That really wants to test more about how can you can you introduce chaos on the front end of the backend. So you have fault injection. Uh, so let, let's say that instead of trying fault injection on the, the network layer, you wanna add it. Is there any plan to, to wrap the requests on? So let's say there's it's a, a, new, a project that's already in production. Okay. But you as a developer to go there and and have um, Mirage on on your front end project. Okay. And let's say instead of having local, you just say I want to have chaos to whatever is coming from actual HTTP requests. So getting the response, wrapping it, and introducing chaos. There okay. Okay. So you you're saying like this chaos approach even without Mirage. No. So with Mirage. Okay. So, but like this, I, I'm not sure I, I, I got your question. Sorry. A layer between your, your backend service and your API, 
and the, 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 the request, and the request will, will flow, yeah. but it, it will be intercepted, and at some point, randomly, it will fail. Yeah, but, okay, so you're, you, you... The project's already done. Okay. You just run the project, and you want to know roughly the scales without affecting the backend. Oh, but th this does not uh, uh, affect the backend. Oh, I, I got you. So you, you want to still, okay, okay, okay. So you want to still do the request to the backend when, and when they come back, you want to change it? Because, exactly. Just, just reform the request and, and introducing errors or network uh, yeah. delays or whatever in the actual HTTP request. And that means that you introduce chaos on the, on the front, end, front end without needing to, to fake or do local, um, local variables here. Okay. And without asking backend developers to give me some chaos here. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Is there so, any plan to do that? Or? So, um, like this does not touch the back end. So, this add chaos worked on the front end. But I think you're, like, if you're talking about proxying and getting what comes from the server and act on that instead of writing Mirage logic, yeah, so it's not plan, but it's actually a very nice feature suggestion. I have one point here that like, if you find this useful, uh, would you use it? Would you not? And what would make you use it or not? Because we're like, Developing features for it, and of course we want to solve everyone's problems. Yeah, sorry. Thanks.